thanks for, thanks for being here tonight. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, director of the Brownberg Museum and Arts Center. It's a real pleasure to have you here. If you haven't seen the Center of Related Photographs that are up now and that were sort of the inspiration for, tonight, for tonight's talk, please feel free to take time afterwards. I'd be happy to answer questions about them if I can. And uh, if you care to come back and look at them again at greater length, it'll be up to March 7th. Uh, I had some difficulty figuring out uh, where to start in introducing tonight's speaker. I printed out his CD which is 14 pages long. <laughs> and uh, there's not a lot of fluff in there, believe me, I, I looked for it. And that's the version that hasn't been updated since 2012. It's, so it's probably like 17 pages now. When we set about planning this exhibit of Senator Leahy's photographs, uh, we had the idea that it would provide the perfect backdrop for a discussion of Senator Leahy's legacy of service to Vermont and to the United States, and also perhaps for uh, consideration of Vermont's contributions to American politics and, and history. Um, so we began to search for a possible presenter on this topic, and very quickly all roads led to Starksboro, or more specifically to Frank Bryan. The history. Uh, Professor Bryan retired in 2013 after 36 years of teaching political science at the University of Vermont. Uh, that weighty CV of his lists scores, if not hundreds, of publications that he's authored on all manner of topics pertaining to Vermont and political science. He's a frequent commentator on VPR. He's been honored by the Vermont legislature for his extraordinary contributions to our state. He was chosen as one of New England's leading humorists by Yankee Magazine. And the Boston Globe credited him with writing one of the most original political analyses ever written about New England. Uh, he's even been called in academic circles the world's leading authority on town meeting, the, the, the institution of town meeting. I hadn't met Professor O'Brien before tonight, but something tells me that he's keeping very busy in his so-called retirement. And a clue, perhaps, is this Jack London quote that I found featured prominently on his website. It says, I would rather be ashes than dust. I would rather my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze than it should be stifled in dry rot. Man's chief purpose is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. Well, on behalf of the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center, I want to thank Professor Ryan for using some of his time here with us tonight. We're delighted he's here and very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Won't you please welcome Frank Lyon. Can I get a tape of that introduction? I'll take that. Well, they're pretty good ladies. She sat through them. How many hundred of them? Thank you very much. It's way too kind. Um, I don't know if you like these things or not. I, I'm not sure public speaking benefits from these in the last 10 years or so of teaching, I began to use them. And it's always a temptation just to use them as kind of visual notes, which is awful. But on the other hand, uh, I guess they can be valuable. There's, a, there's the flag right there. Um, so what I'll do tonight, I think, is to talk about a grandiose subject and, and try to fit the United States set it into that, into the context of that, um, and talk a little bit about Patrick Leahy and and our presence in the Senate and why that's so critical. Uh, well, I'll get to that. Um, so th this is a this is a this was a, one of those great cartoons of the Atlantic. Um, it must have come out what 15, 20 years ago. But I, I, built a, I built an academic career around this, around this cartoon. Um, and so I think it'll become apparent to you as I go through this. By a vote of eight to two, we decided to skip the Industrial Revolution and just go right into the electronic age. And in a nutshell, I think that's what Vermont did. And, uh, as, and that's the good news. All right, um, just to put, the, put my... Uh, comments in context and the United States Senate, especially in context. This is the traditional uh, dynamic of um, 
the development of civilization, really. I mean, if you, if you forget everything before the horse, the cart, and the, the sail. And so we progressed from a long, long rural agrarian tradition <laughs> into a, a relatively short urban industrial revolution, um, depending on when you want to start it, three or 400 years. And recently, in the, last, in, in the 20th century, we took, I think, the, the beginning steps into the techno postmodern world as industrialism was always called modernism, we're beyond that now. And we need, we need a lexicon and we need a concept. And we need a politics especially. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. How can we get from the urban industrial situation to the post-modern world uh, and keep everything intact? Um, urban industrialism, um, Led and required, of course, um, concentration. That was dominant then. Concentration relies on hierarchy. Absolutely key. You can't have organized behavior of hundreds of people without hierarchy. Someone's got to be boss. A span of a, in my other life, I teach public management, believe it or not. Um, you've got to have a span of control. And hundreds of studies have been done on how many people one person should boss around. <laughs> Uh, you know, and it's 12 to 15, no more than that. And each one of them does 12 to 15, and pretty soon you've got a hierarchy. Um, hierarchy requires authority. It, you, you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to be boss. There's got to be some penalties involved. Not, not just power, but the legal right to command within the organization. Lots of people have authority and no power. Um, a lot more have lots of power but no authority. And both of those situations are not good. <laughs> and a lot of hanky-pank occurs because of them. Uh, but at least that's the model. Authority requires symmetry. Got to have it. You just can't organize and direct a lot of people without some symmetrical organization so you know how to think about it. You do the shoveling, you do the manures, whatever it is, you see. Um, it's got to be symmetrical. And symmetry stimulates rigidity, conservatism. It's hard to get a bureaucracy to do anything. As, and, and again, well, I think I'll get to this. Some of you may be thinking, oh, damn. Uh, he's this right-wing crazy that's <laughs> that slipped in. <laughs> um, but hierarchies are rigid. It's hard to get them to do anything, especially quickly. Just think, well, you, lots of you work in the hierarchy. And, and you know that. It's a beautiful thing about farming. It's usually a hierarchy of two. And then the husband and the wife fight about that, you know, and maybe the hired man. Um, and rigidity begets inhumanity. It's awfully hard to be humane in large organizations making decisions about people's lives based on hierarchy, uh, hierarchical um, requirements. And hierarchies are inhumane, fundamentally. Just imagine trying to build in uh, humane dynamics into an organization of 5,000 people. Who, who's going to know them all? What are you going to know about them? You can't know anything. You can know their position and what they can do and what they can't do and how to fire them and how to hire them. Anyway, and that supports a marketplace politics. And that's that we've had that for about 300 years now. So you bring your, 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 uh, your authority and power in the marketplace uh, come because what you have to sell, and that's either your talent or goods or position or whatever it is. And then there'll be the swapping and trading going on, uh, sale, quote, unquote, we made, and we go on about our business. Um, techno postmodern world is what I call it. And that allows us the future. The electronic revolution has began and has continued to be by all too many people to lead to centralization. Because now the leadership has all this information about everybody. So the tyranny is the real threat from electronic technology, the computer. Um, I think that's just the opposite. Um, I think it's going to be awful hard to run a hierarchy uh, in the future 
because everybody's going to know more than they're supposed to know. Uh, we're still in that phase where we're wondering, well, who's going to control the information that gets into the system? But I think in another 50 years, that's going to be pretty much wide open. And think about it, you don't really have to go into work anymore. And so, my whole paradigm rests on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on that premise, that we're looking at a new couple of centuries of deconcentration, not concentration. And the future will be decentralist. It will be decentralist because we all have the power to know a hell of a lot almost instantaneously that we never could have known before. Um, diffusion um, requires networks, not hierarchies. Uh, networks require democracy. You're in a network, there's got to be some basic equality there. Um, democracy promotes variety. By the way, there's, there's, you know, you could throw in the footnotes here. There's a lot of studies, uh, some of them are, are, are uh, con, but most of them are pro if you look at them closely. Um, variety stimulates innovation, in, in, in innovation begets humanity, and humanity supports the politics of human scale. So I'm betting <laughs> the last five or ten, five, the last, I don't know what, two or three years of coherent thought <laughs> to um, trying to uh, prove all this. But the hy hypotheticals are sound, they're grounded in, in an awful lot of research, uh, and they seem to be, uh, to me at least, the way of the future. So then I'm going to put the United States Senate and, and in some sense, uh, Senator Leahy's uh, behavior and his, his promise into the context of this, okay? Um, so we're in search of an, uh, a, uh, a new third word, third word uh, way of ideology, let's just look at this. Some of you have heard me say this before. The left fears big business. Talk to Bernie about that sometime. Big business is the devil. And of course, the right uh, fears big government. Um, of course, the commonality is they both fear big organizations. And one of the things they complain about, both of them, is that they're all in cahoots. Right? And big business is really in the pocket uh, of, of the politics. And the politicians, the politicians in, the, in, in the pockets of big business. That's where they get their money to run for office. You all heard this. I don't have to go into that. And, and so, some of that's true. Some of it isn't true. It's less true in Vermont because we're so small. Don't forget I said that. Because we're so small. Um, and that is going to, I think, produce a, a coalition of human scale that, that will be akin to um, either the address, industrial uh, coalition or the labor co coalition that uh, worked in the last few years. This, this is huge um, in terms of that uh, coalition. Oh, by the way, uh, how do you like my artwork here? <laughs> Pretty good. You really think I did any of this? This woman right here, my wife. <laughs> Melissa does all of this, and she spends a lot of time on it. Pretty damn good, don't you think? <laughs> um, how does the United States fit into the theoretical lexicon of democracy? And of course, our, our intellectual challenge here is to figure out how that third way is going to be democratic. I think it's inherently democratic if we can make it work. Deconcentration is good, and it's better for people to have a lot of information than a little bit of information. Those two things are, I think, givens. Um, so what about the United States Senate? Um, the United States Senate proves once and for all that uh, you do not live in a democracy in America. Words mean things, and we're not a democracy. And it's because of the Senate. You know where I'm going with this. Um, this is not a parliamentary system where there's always an automatic majority. And the, that automatic majority elects the prime minister who becomes the chief executive. And if the majority doesn't get sick of the chief executive, they vote him a vote of no confidence, guess what you have? A new election. We don't have that. We have two equal branches. 
One represents the people. The other does not represent the people. It represents states. We seem to forget that. But we're awfully happy in Vermont this is true. I get it. Um, look, the American political system was created under a pathological fear of government. They went to Philadelphia to make damn sure the center couldn't do anything without a huge consensus. And that fundamental structure is still with us. In fact, it's a little worse. Most of the country, the world looks at how the hell do they do that with, with two houses of the parliament, one that can veto the other? The president can veto both. The Supreme Court can overrule the president. And then the people, I guess, can, by electing different congresspersons, change the court, but it'll take a generation or three. Um, the institution that precludes America from being a democracy is the United States Senate. So Patrick Leahy or anybody uh, is a member of a body that's not fundamentally democratic. Um, and even the Supreme Court is called the United, uh, <laughs> um, what the separate, what the Senate represents as um, invidious uh, representation. I'm going to try to quickly go over this now. Um, if you look at the 26 American states with the smallest population, they are served by 52 senators which could comprise a majority, and they represent 18% of the total population in the United States. 18% of us can stop something or promote something in the United States now. Now that's not a hell of a lot of us. And what is it, were anyone here close to my age and will admit it, over 60? No, not yet. Huh? Everybody's over 60. No. I'm sorry, see, see, see. My, you know what my wife was thinking? What a damn fool. <laughs> um, you know how, where I'm going with this? Well, um, so a Vermonter's vote in the Senate is about 60 times more powerful than a California's. You, you should feel good about that. <laughs> and we do. But it's not democracy. You see. Um, this kind of discrepancy was clearly uh, and finally overruled as, as a principle, as a principle. The Supreme Court can't overrule our democracy because guess what? We can impeach the justices, which we won't do, but we can appoint other justices. You see what I mean? So they're just part of it. Um, does anyone know when the court, remember when the court explicitly said that anything but one person, one vote is not democracy? They call it one man, one vote then. Notice how politically correct I've become. One person, one vote. About 1963. Uh, what? About 1963. <laughs> I hear these three cases. Baker versus Carr, Reynolds versus Sims, and Avery versus uh, Midland County. Those are the three Supreme Court cases that um, overrule geographical representation in all American legislatures. No American legislature has one, even one house with geographical representation. There's no analog to the United States Senate in American states today. Both houses of every legislature are based on population. Now there's, it can't be too accurate. In Vermont, we've only got 30 senators. Um, that, by the way, of course, was always our body that represented the people, right? You don't remember that, do you? How many, how many legislators did the town of Athens, one of my favorite towns in Vermont, <laughs> uh, have in the Vermont legislature in 1960? One. 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 How many did Brattleboro have? One. 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 See, that's not democratic. The people in Athens enjoyed that, but the people in Bradford Brad did not. Um, in 1960, 14% of Vermont, Vermonters could uh, control the House of Representatives in Montpelier. 14% of you, out of all 
the, the, the little town by their sizes. Um, and when you get 51% of the little towns, they, they had only 14% of the population. And we governed ourselves in like every 200 years. And we'd still be doing that except for the Supreme Court, which is not a democratic institution at all. So it's in spite of that, that, that it's in spite of democracy that we're democratic. Um, one, one town, uh, one, uh, one, one legislator. Um, I grew up in Newbury, and uh, we had a population of 1452. Dick Cobb was our, our legislator, House of Representatives. Brattleboro had, what, 11,000 something? 11,000 citizens, more or less, and uh, 690 residents. And he sent Ernest Gibson the third. And when Ernie Gibson got up and voted yes, Dick Cobb got up and voted no. Take that, you city slickers, from down <laughs> in the banana belt south of Windsor. <laughs> Uh, my vote in Newbury had the power of 0.12% of the electorate. A lot of our citizens had the power of 0.014% of the electorate. Um, so, uh, one representative. Crazy, isn't it? Victory grand, the Grammy based on Brunswick Standard. Registered voters in 1960. And every one of those towns sent somebody to the legislature. And they voted against Burlington, Robert Burlington, City. They said, take that, you city slickers. <laughs> um, this is called a, uh, a, uh, a genie index of population inequality or, or uh, distribution. And you can see uh, how um, undemocratic we are. 20 senators uh, represent 126 million people. Um, and um, 20 senators represent 9 million people. So Patrick Leahy is a senator representing not even a good sized town in the state of New York. Now, we like that. <laughs> Go, Patrick. Don't we? I mean, so many of people in this room would feel perfectly at home in calling him Patrick. I wouldn't, but, but I, you know, I mean, come on. Um, there's California, there's Vermont. We're really advantaged, aren't we? Do, aren't you please? Yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, New York, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go through the Senate. Um, all right. This is one, one of the problems with implementing a theoretical problem, a new human scale agenda, and that's what I want to talk about now. Um, you'd need, in other words, suppose we wanted to do something about that situation and put in place in America a, a real democracy. You'd have to have strong party discipline. You have to have a, uh, uh, a party adopt that, uh, a new agenda. Or any agenda, any policy, you have to have these things. You'd have to have it begin in the Senate because it would begin nowhere else. I mean, the House of Representatives is not going to introduce um, anything to um, democratize the Senate. Um, where more human scale <laughs> politics are more apt to prevail, and a president who champions the agenda. You're going to have to have all those things um, at one time. Yeah. Why wouldn't the House want to democratize the Senate? What's your point? Well, I, the House members and Senate members now, I think, are both jealous of the prerogatives. The House likes the fact that they're, they're the democracy. Um, I don't think, I think you're right, I don't think there's any inherent bias there. I just don't, I, I don't think they would be pleased with that either. Um, now, they're the democratic branch. Um, and so many of them want to be senators. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you had that in mind. <laughs> what if? So in order to um, develop this dream of a human scale politics, we'd have to decentralize policy. You're never going to have a human scale politics at the center of a nation state. 
You're not going to have a human scale politics even at the center of Vermont. Human scale politics means I may not know you personally, but I'm at, I might make, meet you on the street. A human scale politics is the politics where we have um, a prerequisite to be humane to each other. <laughs> kind of, if that's the right thing. Um, I like to put it this way when you leave a town hall after a town meeting and walk to your car, you may have to walk to your car with someone that you had just debated in town meeting. And you're going to be careful in town meeting not to be an ass about it. Because you, you have to talk to them face to face on a human scale. Now that's a terribly important thing. We sacrifice that at, at <clears throat> great danger to the republic. It has to be ingrained in people early. And that requires small places. Um, what if the party was Democrats and the, and the president was Obama? How would we do it? Just to pick. Now, let's suppose we could talk Pat Leahy into it. <laughs> um, again, I'm promoting party unity here. These are Pat Leahy, um, I just um, got these up the last couple of days, Pat Leahy scores on party unity from 2003 to 2012. A lot of data in that little line, but what does that tell you? Senator Leahy is a confirmed partisan. <laughs> He's not interested in compromise. He may say he is. I'm not knocking Patrick Leahy. When it gets down to it, he's a Democrat with a capital D. <laughs> My mother was a Democrat with a capital D. And back in the Roosevelt days, things have changed. But Patrick Leahy is a Democrat. He's a loyal Democrat. Um, he votes with his party. Uh, that's good, in a sense, because it's honest. You're electing a Democrat. He's not going to promise, well, maybe I'll be a, well, he will say he's a, you know, cut him some slack, you see. Um, but no, he's not. Would you be just as happy if I said he was a Republican? I mean, if I used a Republican example? No. You see, you would, but you've got to be. <laughs> when you listen to me, you've got to get rid of this partisanship. It ain't going to work. I mean, if you really believe that the Democrats are odious and, or vice versa, you know, we can't have a conversation. Because they're not. They just believe different things. Um, did I just go through two? No, you just screwed it up. What's that? <laughs> What's that? You screwed it up. Did I screw it up? Yeah. Help me, dear. Help me. Just keep looking. The back. bottom one? No, no. The, top. the middle one. No, the top one. The top one. <laughs> no, dear. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I cut down the trees. You must have got them. Leahy scores, and by the way, you'd have to have, you'd have to have the, kind of like a parliamentary system, you'd have to have the dominant party controlling the presidency, right? Now, would Pat Leahy be good at that? Oh yeah. You elect Pat Leahy, he's voting with Obama. Got it? And look at the difference there. Uh, huge. Now I'm going to look at Pat Leahy's elections, um, how well he's done in Vermont. Um, and you might think about this in, in this way. Does, if the elections are close, does that help democracy or hurt democracy? In a sense, there's a lot of literature on that, a lot of game theoretical models built. If it's a 49-51 kind of election, then people may, may have more power to to ask of things, th uh, uh, politicians for stuff. Um, and if you've got a huge majority, um, then you're pretty safe. Um, remember these? You're showing your age. Remember Dick Mallory? Good guy. Dick Mallory is a guy, when you shook his hand, he had real calluses on. 
He was a farmer, he worked on a farm, and he knew it just by shaking his hand. Um, Stuart Ledbetter, remember that? By the way, pretty damn close elections, aren't they? Look at that. Um, poor Dick. Um, he's a smart guy, but he just, he just took his, laid his clock. Um, Jim Douglas. Fred Tuttle. <laughs> Come on, Tim. Remember him? Yeah. Yeah, the love him. Um, Ron, very conservative guy. Now that's his um, elections, and he's done pretty well. He's got a strong base in Vermont. Seems to me that he um, is protected by that. He could take some chances in the Senate, and we'd still elect him. You think? Uh, look at this. In modern history, no incumbent Senator Vermont has been defeated. This is important because, I, because in order for Vermont to save America, which is what I'm here to encourage you to support, um, this has to be. This is very, very helpful. Uh, I, I call it, what was it? The, the doors of the Senate swing inward for Vermont, but they don't swing outward. Once you're there, baby, you got it. Man. Oh, oh, by the way, I, it may come up here. It will. I'll say it in another moment. Um, no incumbents have been defeated. Uh, I, I'm not, this, would, this would take the run. I'm already behind time. Um, but a lot of you remember the, the Gibson Aiken Senate seat. Um, the Gibson Aiken Coalition, by the way, was prevalent throughout Vermont, some of you may remember, as the liberal wing of the Republican Party. <laughs> and there was, since it was only one party, it, the Proctor family, well, Democrats like to say they control, but he didn't really control, but there was the Proctor <coughs> wing of the party, which was conservative, and there was the gibson Aiken wing of the, of, the, of the Republican Party, which was progressive and liberal. And that was our two-party system, and it worked pretty well as a two-party system. Democrats didn't have a prayer um, in those days. Um, and so that's their seat. And so Senator Leahy um, is part of that tradition. And this part of Vermont's part of that tradition, hugely part of that tradition, isn't it? Aiken, Gibson. Um, then there's the Austin uh, Flanders seat. Um, again, I won't go uh, through these, um, but these are these are our senators, retired, died in office, appointed to replace Crowdy. Uh, Jeffords retired, and Sanders is still there. Um, so we've had a lot more um, variety in that seat. But what don't we have there? <laughs> we don't have anyone um, being defeated. Um, it's in the Austin Flanders seat, you really don't have it. Senator Lee is the only Democrat ever. Uh, to, uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Right. Right. You're right, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I think I may not have put that slide in. So, uh, one thing that I always uh, I admired about Leahy was that his first two elections were very close. We're talking a couple percentage points. But he didn't back off from his fundamental liberalism, Big L. And this data shows that. Even when he represented a state that really wasn't sure for the first two terms, it's close, he still stuck to his guns in the Senate um, and acted um, like a delegate. In political science, we, we teach our undergraduates there's two models of representation. Um, uh, one is, is the delegate, where you are elected just to voice the interests of your um, constituents, and then the trustee. And the trustee model says you're, in, you're elected, you're trusted by the electorate to make decisions as you see them at the time. Mm -hmm. And Leahy is a trustee, and Vermonters, I think, follow that trustee model. Um, and those are the um, 
His writing's on the interest group, and nothing surprises you, does it? I have a question. I've had it for, I, I began to work on the, the, just the data on this about two or three days ago. Does any, because I don't have the answer. What the hell went on there about the year 2000? When Leahy's interest group rankings um, um, dropped down on the American Civil Liberties Union, um, and uh, I, 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 did, I just what committees was he on then? It was probably the Patriot Act to, to drop on the ACLU, and probably uh, yeah, yeah. probably recognizing China as a trade partner. That, that's too soon. I'm just estimating. It wasn't well, think about it. I, 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 it's, it's just interesting that there's that drop in that one ranking. By the way, these rankings are very, very good. These, these associations build up for every representative, every senator over time. And, and, and their, their votes on bills that interest them as an interest group. And you see, uh, uh, Pat is true to form to his interests. I mean, there's really, a, anyways, I was interested in that. Um, here's Americans for Democratic action ratings for Senator Leahy and the Senate average. So you see, Senator Leahy is not only a Democrat, he is a liberal, liberal Democrat. But in the Senate average, you should have split Democrats and Republicans. Uh, that's the entire, or is that only the Democrats? Oh, only the Democrats, oh. yeah, yeah. He's, um, matter of fact, I had to break that down by party. I wonder how that would go. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, if the theoretical future that I outlined at the beginning of the talk is unfolding, as, as I suggest it is, um, that we're facing a whole new paradigm of life and politics on the planet, that there's third, this third wave model. Uh, I suggest it well, then it's imperative that the nation responds to this future appropriately. And we're not doing that. See, even the lexicon of the media now, the media is now wailing about the lack of bipartisanship. They're, they're wailing that the, the Washington is too divisive. Wrong message. Look, averages are always blah. I mean, that's how we stumble through our policy. And we could do it because we were the richest country in America. And we had a, and we had a, this is another lecture, but when I explain why this is important, the crazies in America went west. <laughs> they did. Davy Crockett, they, they kept going west. It's true. Um, you read all, all the demographic studies and the social psychological studies about the American frontier and the bright, energetic crazies left Vermont and they went west. We had a safety valve, you see? Um, we don't have any safety valve anymore. And we can't get anything done if we're going to have to have um, compromise all the time. Because it's we got we got some real work to do here, and it's going to hurt a lot of people, and we can't just muddle through 4951. Oh well, this isn't what we really need. In fact, it's going to cause a lot of harm over here, but it'll help some people there, and it'll get us through the day. And what the hell? And if things go down, we'll just open up another gold mine, or conquer another country, or add something else. That, because we're America, but we're not anymore. You see, um, that's why a parliamentary system seems. Okay, of course, we could. Everyone said, Brian, you can't have that in America. We're too diverse. Well, we'd better stop being diverse if we're going to control ourselves from the center. It won't work. Um, uh, that can only happen if the ascending <coughs> paradigm is represented by poli uh, politicians in, in Washington. Got it? I mean, we have to deal with that leapfrog theory. Um, Vermont and other small states where the nature of political communitarianism is understood must have a powerful national voice. Senator Leahy represents that voice and that future. I, I'm being an asshole about this, I know, but America needs to be governed by people like us. 
<laughs> by people that have a tradition of human scale politics, who were raised in small towns. When you're, when you're raised in large towns, especially cities, you can choose your friends. There's always somebody to play with, right? You don't, in Vermont, you've got to get along with Danny Rugg. Remember Danny Rugg? Anyone remember Danny Rugg? Sean, oh, come on. The Bobsy twins? <laughs> Freddie and Flossie and Dick and whatever? Well, the, who was the bully? Danny Rugg. I'm going to do an essay. Can I just do this? You know, we need Mark Twain. And you know why we can't have Mark Twain? Because of political correctness. Have you read Tom Sawyer lately? You know what the, how that ends? You remember what, how it ends? They're having a graduation at the school, and there's this pompous guy giving a flowery speech on the podium, and Tom and his friends get up in the structure above the uh, stage, you know what it is, and, and they tie a cat, blindfold the cat, tie his mouth shut, tie his back legs to a rope, and lower the cat down over the speaker. And the cat, of course, is dead. See, you don't like this, do you? You like cats. I'm being politically incorrect. We're screwed. I mean, I can't. Uh, and the cat's flailing along, right? And what does the cat do? He rips off the wig of the speaker. And that's the last paragraph of Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer would be outlawed today. Huckleberry Finn would be outlawed. But how can you raise kids without Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn? You can't do it. You, you've got to give them the freedom to make mistakes. And we've just got to be so politically correct now, you don't even like the fact that, that they use a cat. <laughs> my, my, my wife, she's got this cat. <laughs> go get the cat. It's going on. I just, I'll show you what I'm going to do with that cat. I'm going to make um, Senator Leonard Ray represents that voice in that future, it seems to me. And other Vermont senators, too. I think Patrick Leahy, and I'm not being partisan here, I think Patrick Leahy has a sense. He had to have growing up in Montpelier, going to St. Michael's College. I went to St. Michael's College. You got to know everybody at St. Michael's. And did we raise hell? I was a few years after the Leahy, so I can't pin anything on him, but I'll bet you. <laughs> um, conclusions. Vermont and the Senate of the ascending uh, paradigm. I think Vermont and other states like Vermont are absolutely key um, to demanding a human scale politics at the national level. Um, a lot of classical conservatives are not going to like this, nor are classical liberals going to like it um, at all. Um, civil rights, liberties, defense, environment, protection, interstate commerce to the center. Now, by the way, that really fits Leahy. Um, civil rights and environmental protection have been his two major interests throughout his career. How come then that the, his ACLU rating was so crappy compared to the Conservation League? It was never, it was never crappy. It, it dropped down at that one point that I couldn't explain. I don't know why that was, but basically it's very strong. But it was much lower than the Conservation I don't think it was, was it? Let's back up. Let's back up. Sorry, I'm going to be embarrassed. Am I doing it right, honey? Yeah. Yeah. I think you passed it. Oh, I passed it. Right now. There. There. League of Conservation Voters. That's highest. American Civil Liberties Union. Lost a decade. That's uh, <laughs> except for that little decade there. The ACLU goes down. doesn't like it as much as the League of Conservation Voters. I yeah, I think well, that's true at that period. In that period. I, and as I said, I don't know why that's true. Um, yeah. Um, but that's a pretty good record for him, isn't it? I mean, that's way above the Senate average. Hey, anyway, where were we here? Um, Okay, um, here's where, I, 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 here's where the, the argument gets difficult. Substantive policy like education, social welfare, and health 
should be go to the parts. In other words, um, if it takes intimate knowledge of individual human beings, if it's a human scale policy, not a system scale policy, it ought to be it ought to fit the environment um, of the community. Now, what is that? A lot of you are not going to like this. I know where I'm speaking. <laughs> um, but what about national health care? There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that if you put into place a national health care policy that's efficient, it will be inhumane. Because we can't define every situation. We've got to trust ourselves somewhere. Um, and by the way, a lot of it is untouchable in politics because it's the bureaucracy that makes those decisions. There's only one way if you look at health care. Now, where does it go wrong? Not in its concept, not in the statute, but in its uh, uh, implementing it on the ground with people like you and me. See what I mean? And the only way to make that work is to give the people on the ground an awful lot of latitude. But if you give people a, an awful lot of latitude, you're apt to get an awful lot of results that you don't like. See what a problem that is? Um, now, when you say the parts, are, do you talk, you mean about specific locales? Yeah, 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 the states. states right. Okay, so you can yeah, the state. yeah. So um, like a state-run healthcare system. Yeah, I'm not, if, if a state-run state bureaucratically, which is what we've got. I mean, again, this is, this is just my politics, but I, I was very upset when, and I didn't even know the specific, maybe you can help me. Uh, when Peter Shulman, whom I voted for, because he's for the two-year term, um, abandoned. Did he abandon? Yeah, pretty much. And to me, I go around the country bragging that we were one of the first people to have statewide socialized medicine. <laughs> and if it's in Vermont, what the hell? Let's give it a try. If it's in the country, I don't want any part of it. <laughs> you see what I mean? Now, I'm not asking you to agree with me, but think about it that way. It's hugely different. It's got to be, doesn't it? You've got to make a health care system to work in Texas, Alaska, and Rhode Island. And the only way to do that is to make it so general that the folks in Texas and those places are going to do what they want to anyways. <laughs> so why not just let them um, develop it? And by the way, use these other powers that I would strengthen at the national level against discrimination and bias, and I think we can do that, to make sure that, that that implementation is fair. And by the way, let me ask you this. The electronic revolution supports, I think, my answer there. It's going to be awful hard to hide now egregious violations <coughs> of, of, of policy. People can get on the internet immediately and um, just universalize information overnight. I think we have to pay attention to that. The, the, it isn't the same country it was at the turn of the century. <laughs> I'm getting pretty old. <laughs> the last century of the century before. It really isn't. Um, there can never be another Mississippi. And I hate to pick on Mississippi because although they may have deserved it, I just hate to kick people when they're down. And that comes from a town meeting background, I think. Empathy. Poor bastards down there. <laughs> Um, the current alumni. The rigidity uh, of ideological imperatives, that's a problem. How to bring the decentralist left and the right together to form a nucleus of human scale values. Remember, the, the, the Republicans are decentralists because they're interested in the private sector. Um, Democrats, I think, can be decentralists because they're interested in the public sector. And somehow we've got to bring that together. Somehow we've got to bring that together. Um, information tech technology and John Nesbitt's third wave, see, see the book Megatrends, mm -hmm. huge influence on America, certainly on my life, um, indicate that this capacity supports human scale policy in the peripheries rather than centralized policy in Washington. I think the wave of the future is decentralized. 
computer is a decentralized um, invention. It's not a centralizing invention. Now, we, we have all these bugaboos about someone getting hold of the information. It's going to be awful hard to do that. Either we're all pretty good people and we'll stop them down, or we're all jackasses and we'll let them do it, but we're going to know about it. We're going to know about it instantly. That's the problem. Um, so I think the technology is with us, just as um, the technology of the urban industrial revolution was with centralism. Sure. Yeah. Um, working in a factory, got a whole bunch of people together. You gotta have a belt go by and you put on this and I'll put on that. It, that you know, have to get there at eight o'clock. Rigidity. What, what, what am I, I know I'm, I'm going on too long. Uh, one of my favorite professors at, at um, the University of Vermont was Raoul Hilbert that wrote the definitive work on the destruction of the European Jews. I mean, if you were in a, in a uh, coffee house in Vienna in 1950, talking about the Holocaust, and you mentioned uh, Hilberg, um, they'd know it. If you, if you were there talking about the Russian Revolution, R.B. Daniels would have known it. Those two guys uh, were my favorite, and he, he um, absolutely, I think, um, agreed with that notion about how technology drives politics, both of them. One of my recurring memories in my career as a graduate student at UVM, the day that uh, Khrushchev was posed. And I was taking a seminar with R.V. Daniels, who wrote The Conscience of the Revolution and had been in the work on the Russian Revolution. And I was the first one to walk into his office and say, Khrushchev is gone, 1964, fall of 64. He never flinched. No kidding. I have to check on that. <laughs> I love it. Um, so information is decentralist in character, not centralist. Um, the assembly line is dying out. You're working at home. Don't have to be there on time. Um, all right. I'll end it with a letter that I hope someone here would. Uh, Bert, uh, uh, Pat and Leahy's going to get a film of this or something. So I'll say myself. Post it down. Here you go, Pat. Um, dear Senator Leahy, congratulations on 40 years in the Senate. You must run again in 2016. I know you're old because I am about the same age. <laughs> the hell with that, run anyway. Adopt, I was going to put my new agenda. <laughs> Let's put mine in there. Adopt my new agenda <laughs> and thereby save the nation. Audacity. Who, who was that great? General, General Foch in the French Army did audacity, toujours audacity in military. That's uh, sincerely Frank Bryan of Starksboro. P.S. See what you can do with Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? How did you mean that? Uh, which? The Bernie no, the very last line? Yeah. 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 Well, I, I knew if I put it, and Melissa told me this. She, she said, they're not going to know what you mean. I said, I know, that's why it's so much fun. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> um, they vote together. Is Sanders <coughs> part of the problem or part of the solution? Well, he's a problem in the sense that I think he should uh, join the Democrat Party. But he votes in the Democrats. So I, I don't think he can follow them. I think it was a breath of fresh air in Vermont. Um, yeah. But I believe in the two-party system. I think we have to have a strong party system um, to do the, make the decisions that have to be made to prepare us for this, the, uh, the, uh, the future. And, and it, it can't be done. I mean, we, we need another Roosevelt. I mean, Roosevelt did things that were unheard of. And now no politician wants to do that. And you can't do it. So that's, 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 that's really bad news. But Roosevelt wouldn't have been Roosevelt in this uh, new era of decentralized information. No, no, no he, but he wouldn't have needed to be. See, I mean, in Roosevelt's time, he was, he was perfect for his time. I mean, they did have the telephone, the telegraph. Um, but yeah, I, th I thought he fit that time. 
Well, he was, I think he would have, a smart guy would have changed and agreed with me <laughs> at this point. But that, that was clearly a different time. Um, I remember Roosevelt, well, he was there during the war. You know, and that was huge. Uh, I mean, uh, there'll, never, there'll never be another situation like that with Roosevelt. Uh, my mother, as I said, worked on the assembly line and Cone Automatic grew up in Windsor. Of course a Democrat. A uh, little tiny town in Newbury. And, uh, but God, uh, how she loved Roosevelt. And Roosevelt was a god to her. Yeah. And she liked, that was the angel. What is the, uh, that, those are the better angels of her nature. The evil angels of her nature when she liked Truman. <laughs> she never told me she'd rather sleep with Truman than Roosevelt. <laughs> but I think my mother probably would have. If I can end this talk with something very... Is that too much? Yeah, I'm sorry. I know my mom. She likes feisty, feisty guys. Yes. So I, I want to get back to the the local decisions. Yeah. I, you know, we're talking about health care, but one of the big conversations we're having right now, obviously, is education policy and funding. Um, you know, I guess the dilemma that we're facing is a uh, more bottom-up or top-down approach. I kind Absolutely. of am curious about your take on Got to be bottom up. Shumlin was nuts with that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was at a talk that he gave one time, and he was saying, "You know something? Kindergarten isn't enough. We've got to have compulsory pre-kindergarten." And he showed data showing how we all families would be richer if that happened. And afterwards, I said, "No." So you want the five-year-olds and the four-year-olds to go to school? Yes, but not for the whole day. Maybe just the forenoon. And I said, I got two questions. How are you going to get them to the schoolhouse? And what are you going to do with them in the afternoon? Now, I live on a back road in Starksboro, and uh, we have a lot of working class, let's put it that way, people. And their kids stand outside the house in the cold waiting for the school bus. Guess where the, how the professional kids get to school? Their parents bring them. You want to put a five-year-old girl outside of the road to get on the school bus for an hour and 15 minutes? McClary and I wrote about this in the, in the, in the Vermont papers. Yeah. And that's inhumane. You should be arrested for that. The, the, the technology of centralism can really be seen. And that's a five-year-old girl. You want to give her a hug. You don't want to put her in the school bus with all those kids. Uh, let me just share this. When I, I spent a year in Starkville, Mississippi, studying rural politics, I'm into the small, and in uh, eastern Mississippi, <laughs> Howard Ball, who was then dean at UVM, said to him, Frank, you're going down there for a year to teach and, and study rural politics in Mississippi? He says, yeah. He said, well, I've been down to Starkville. He said, um, trust me, Starkville isn't the end of the world. But you can see Starkville from the end of the world. No, but you can see the end of the world from Starkville. <laughs> that's true. If you look east, you, you can see Western Alabama. Um, but anyways, when we would take our kids to school in Starkville, this is a town about the size of Brownsboro, actually. When you say it, Lee, about 14,000, 15,000, would that be fair? Something like that. Uh, and, and it had the university there. Um, and the school buses came and all lined up. Guess who got off the school buses? to a person, black kids. Guess how the white kids got there? Either in their own cars or their parents brought them. Now, you're gonna, you're gonna write a law to fix that? You can't write a law to fix that, can you? That's social, uh, uh, people told me down there that if you could raise the, 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 the media family income of black families in the South, you'd solve 90% of the discrimination. And I'm telling you, it's discriminatory in a rural area to put those kids on a school bus. It hurts them, it's not good for them, and guess who's gonna benefit from them? The rich kids, the middle class kids. The poor kids are gonna go on the school bus. Challenge them. Go to where people meet to get on the school buses in rural Vermont sometime. Take a look and see who's getting on the school bus. Yeah? But that doesn't mean they shouldn't be going to school, and it doesn't mean that, it doesn't necessarily mean that the four or five year old girls shouldn't be going to half day pre-K. It's a problem if the only way she can get there 
is by standing out in the cold and having to take a bus. But that doesn't necessarily, that, that maybe means we have to solve that problem in a, in a different way. Oh, I, I think that's true. And, and, and uh, I think I could make an argument with you, uh, but I'm not qualified to, that um, <clears throat> group behavior of the kind you find in schools, even well-run kindergartens, um, is not the best for kids under five, six years old. But I, I don't have any empirical evidence for that. I just hate to take the kids out of the moment pop them into the school, but that's just a personal kind of gut feeling I have about education. And um, I, again, I, we just have to think creatively about how how to do these things. And uh, electronic gimmickry and education not helping anybody. Um, you know, human, uh, teaching, uh, my first year teaching was in a high school in the Northeast Kingdom. And I was a hell of a teacher at UVM, if I may say so. Okay, don't, don't record that. But you know why? I became a hell of a teacher teaching those rowdy, uh, great kids up in Orleans, <laughs> Vermont. Um, can I tell a story? I love telling you stories. Human scale, like we are in Vermont, where you can't escape, really, um, the results of your actions. People know you. They know you pretty well. And I think that's what's always made Vermont such a beautiful place. So many people. Uh, Lee and I are now uh, working on a book called the Vermont Book of Familiar Quotations, you know, Apartments Book of Familiar, and we're going to have, God, sorry, Lee, but we're going to have three or four thousand of the great quotes in Vermont. And as you go through that stuff, reading those quotes, uh, or, or looking for them, even, it really was true that, that throughout the 20th century, we had an optimal society in Vermont. There was a lot of trouble with it, of course, but God, we're human beings. But those small schools um, taught certain values that, we're, we're, that we've lost. Um, and I don't know how the hell to get them back. I mean, it's original sin, I think, really. <laughs> For us, I guess. I mean, life's tough. And um, you gotta work it through, I think. And that happens in small, small communities. And, and by the way, and, and you can decentralize within larger communities. We tr we tried to do that uh, back in the 70s and 80s nationally, you know, with community action. But the problem is that the community action council didn't have any power. They couldn't say do this or don't do that. And pretty soon people just get similar. What's that s sexual thing I used to use in one of my classes? Oh, uh, uh, the sexual act is without completion is not satisfying. And pretty soon. Both people just go home. And that's the same with democracy. Unless there's completion, pretty soon you go home. And by the way, if I have one expertise, it's town meeting. My book on town meeting was published off the, by the University of Chicago Press, which was then ranked the fifth best academic press in America. And I went, so I know about town meeting. And that's the great value of town meeting. It, there's, a, there's a goddamn vote. Well, there ought to be. And we're taking the votes away from town meeting. This is the problem with, with consolidation of education. You give me almost any town in Vermont and put 25 or 30 percent of the really interested people in the public sector in a room, and they'll do just fine. They don't need to, I'm, I'm sounding like a crazy right winger, right? <laughs> they don't need to be told how to teach kids. They don't even really need to be told what to teach them. I mean, by the way, the data on the increasing complexity of political units that I find in the states is also true in Vermont. You drop into any Vermont town at random now and do that Rice Index of Social Economic Heterogeneity, which is a measure of diversity. And the standard deviation among towns since the 1930s have been going right downhill. That is to say, the towns are more and more similar to the whole. And we'd say, well, those towns up in the Northeast Kingdom, go up there sometime. They could be just as, well, maybe not as progressive as, as down here, because you're very progressive. But yeah, I, I, I just don't know why we think that education's going to be better 
And I, I, again, I wish Peter was here, but again, one of the arguments he used, of course, it would save money. I'm so sick of that argument in education. It, that's, it, saving money is not the point here. Um, it's quality education. Pay the teachers what they need, give them the freedom to teach, uh, maintain the discipline, uh, and everything will be fine. One more question, yeah. You, you showed a very dramatic um, slide or picture <clears throat> with California at one end and Vermont at the other. And at first I thought you found that unfavorable. But in a sense, that's the thing that may or may not save us. We, we, we couldn't get that up. I, what was that? It, it was that Vermonters were 60 times as a Vermont senator was 60 times as powerful as a California yeah. senator, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and you're and you're, you're coming on that. You denigrated that. On the other hand, that's what's going to save us because the fact that our senators are 60 times as powerful as 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 some other states' uh, senators means that we have the power, oh, even no, though okay. it's incredibly undemocratic, we have the power to save things. Oh, by the way, then I apologize. And I've screwed up the lecture because I, I meant just the opposite. I meant profoundly just the opposite. Uh -huh. The fact that we're not democratic and that we're so heavily in it is, good, is really good for us. Yeah. Bobby didn't like and I apologize for that. Yeah, I, I, to, to, Thank you for that question, because if that was unclear, I want to make it clear. To me, that's what's so beautiful about this damn sure. state. Now, just one little postscript to that, and that is, is there any way to carve up some of the other states so they get that human quality, so that there are a bunch of Vermont-sized states? <laughs> well, I'd like to see more Vermont-sized states, and I, I'd have some suggestions. Oh, by the way, um, because we got, you remember the book, The 19 Nations of North America? Came out about 20 years ago. And, uh, the guy talked about nationality. Um, you, you know, there's a, the, we're having this trouble in the Middle East now. What's a nation state? You can have a Muslim nation, but is that a state? And if that's a state, does it link to geography? Mm -hmm. And uh, in America, uh, the states are still terribly, terribly powerful. Um, and, and I think that's where the policy ought to, ought to go. Um, I missed a point here somewhere in this. I'm just wondering whether California should be cut into third. Yeah. Um, well, well <laughs> that, that, that would be great. There we go. But, we're not going to do that because California is in the Senate. Um, but, it, but it seems to me within California, that's where the decentralism has to, has to come to. Um, yeah, the, the, the states in America were created oddly. Um, and, and they represent different <coughs> nations. Um, Chesterton once was uh, the great English philosopher was once um, asked to um, describe the Irish. And he said, um, all their wars are merry and all their songs are sad. And I thought that was the most beautiful description of a nation, small n, of a people. Uh, and we have lots of those nations uh, in America. It would be nice to have the states coincident with the nations, but we're, we're not going to get there. I think, the, I think we have to decentralize to the states, but it would be even better to decentralize to the localities. But, of course, always maintain, in other words, strengthen the center in terms of civil rights and civil liberties. And a lot of conservatives are very afraid of this, and a lot of lefties are too, because they're worried about Uncle Sam getting too much information and too much control. I mean, that's a left and a right-wing um, um, argument. But it seems that we, we have to have a level playing field and we can't decentralize. You can't have, um, and, and again, but as I say, I mean, myself, the empirical reality is that almost all localities in America are more empirically like the nation than they've ever been before. So we're, we're cross-fertilizing, we're, we're getting much more heterogeneous at the localities. 
Um, some states are better than others. But it seems to me that the value of having to face your neighbor's accurate decision is more humanizing and more progressive and more liberal than, than anything else. So I'm going to quit now and thank you for your attention.